Uh, you're welcome to, maybe I should sit. You're welcome to our PhD literature symposium uh, of the month of July. But before we go into the details of our program, let me invite Professor Emmanuel, Emmanuel Moranga to give us a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father, we realize that learning is something that you instituted uh, in human nature. A baby does not come into the world with all the knowledge that he, she will need in this world, but rather he or she has to learn as the days and the weeks and the months and the years go by, even the decades. In the same way, we who are already adults always have something new to learn, and we shall be learning and learning and learning until we leave this world. So I pray this morning, Lord, for a special spirit of humility, that, Lord, we may be humble in our hearts and minds so that we can be receptive to whatever may be new to us and whatever we know help us share it with humility. So guide us, Lord, as we go ahead. Guide our coordinator, Dr. Cornelius Gulere. Guide our PhD students, Mary uh, Naula and Mr. Aringo, and help them, Lord, and help us all to work together and to harmonize beautifully to your, to your own and to your glory. We thank you also for this facility uh, here in the Uganda Christian University. We praise you and glorify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, thank you very much, Prof, for that wonderful prayer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome to this very important symposium. We have two major papers to be presented, and um, you'll be hearing from the presenters themselves who will introduce themselves and tell us the title and the inspiration for the kind of work. I would like to, invite, uh, to thank you, Professor Muranga, um, the principal supervisor, and uh, all the members of the UCU community, the master's students present, for coming and honoring this very important event. Uh, one of the uh, issues that uh, Uganda Christian University points at is um, professionalism and character development. That is our niche. And in these papers, we are exactly doing that, looking for avenues of serving our nation and the world at large. In yesterday's new vision, uh, we had an article in the education vision talking about child abuse. And the advice is that you should not suffer in silence. And here before us, we have Mary Naula, a PhD literature candidate who is researching on bullying in schools and is going to talk to us how this has been depicted in Chomhendo's first daughter and Mary Karuro Kurutu's Invisible Weevil. It's my pleasure to call upon uh, Ms. Mary Naula to take the floor. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. I'm grateful to be here, and um, I want to thank Professor Moranga and uh, Dr. Guleri, my supervisors. I'm grateful for so far where we have reached and where we are going. So today's presentation um, res um, the research is on bullying in schools as depicted in Goretti Shomohendo's first daughter and Mary Karoro Kuruti's Invisible Weevil, researched by Mary Naula. Introduction. 
This paper examines the depictions of bullying in schools in two selected Uganda novels. Great Shomo Hendo, 1996, The First Daughter. Uh, Karoro Okuruti, 1999, 1998, The Invisible Weaver. Problem statement. Educational values in Uganda, in Ugandan schools, have dropped to excessive bullying. This has resulted in students' fear, continuous threat, bitterness, revenge, and torture in the real world, with the consequences of long-lasting depression in the life of students and the teachers. The purpose of the study, the purpose of this study is to show how Shomo Hindu and Okurut portray the values bullying to bracket in the post-colonial education. Literature review. Russ, Kalukas, and Model, 2011, found out that bullying is one of the biggest problems that children face in education system, and it is one of the most important health risks. Al-Rakad, Etel, 2007, I said that bullying is both physical and verbal violence, and it can affect the emotional, social, and physical well-being of students and staff. Hadei Cynthia found out that bullying, bully students fear coming to school because they feel that they are unsafe, and this downs on their academic success. Barack Etel, 2012, argues that bullying, that bullying victims are anxious, shy, and weak, and their performance in school is poor. Tugume, 2015, understands that bullying has the transfer of aggression to force the bull to do what pleases the buller. Literature review. Have I done? A study in South Africa by Ndembele and Caesar, 2014, revealed that bullying manifests in itself as kicking, beating, calling names, bad treatment of others, hurting others, forcing others to do what they did not like, screaming at others. A study in Kenya by Ndetei, 2007, found bullying as taking place in the dormitories, playgrounds, corridors, and on the way to and from school. A study in U.S. by Hamel and Suera, 2015, found that bullying, bullying takes place Bullying takes many forms, I'm sorry. Physical harm, verbal taunts, threats, ex exclusion, humiliation, and rumor spreading. Electronic harassment, using texts, emails, or online mediums. A study in Nigeria by Omoteso, 2010, found effects of bullying to be fear, loneliness, depression, and lack of confidence. A study, by US, a study in U.S. by Hawker and Bolton, 2004, that students who are bullied suffer from anxiety, loneliness, and depression. Methodology. Qualitative description, descriptive study is used. Qualitative content analysis is a method uh, where text, textual analysis is done. I read the book, recorded, and analyzed, picked out themes and the characterization. A thematic interpretation is made. 
Postcolonial literary theory is used, and the major tenets of this theory are Edward Said, Gayatri, Chakravati, Spavik, Spavak, and Hom Kebaba. Uh, Postcolonial theory deals with the literature written in previously colonized countries, that is Uganda, where Great Ishomo Hendo comes from, and Karoro Okuruti. Uh, Postcolonial literary theory highlights the way colonized cultures conflicts with experiences of the colonized people, as we shall see in the novels. Findings. Uh, this um, findings and discussion. Uh, Fabo bullying, demonizing in Shomo Hendo, in Great Shomo Hendo's first daughter. As Casimir comes to school, is a boarding school, reports, she's ushered to the dormitory where she is received by the warden. And as she is ushered in the room, she's welcomed by two ladies who were seated. They didn't say anything to her. And immediately she enters the dormitory, a group of girls appeared in the room all squeezed in a small room. And they didn't say any word to her. The first word she hears from this group of ladies is one called, that is a brand new. Another one said, I wonder from which zoo she has come from. Immediately, one of the girls tickled Casimir's head as if to kiss her, but instead spat in her face. Then the last one says, we want Ninemo, you got. When we look at this kind of bullying that is taking place, I have categorized them as verbal bullying, dehumanizing, and many others as we shall discuss. First, to name somebody a got, coming from the zoo, that is a verbal bullying, where Casimir found herself in. And she, of course, she couldn't answer anything before long. She's spat on the face, dehumanizing her as uh, she's worthless to the community where she has joined. And to call her goat is also a word that is connected to colonization, where human, Africans were dehumanized. The bullying continues with Casimir. They forced her suitcase open and remove all the roasted genus and maize. And they started eating it. They eating the maize and the genus when she's looking on. And one of the leader comes and gives her a question. Have you ever slept with a man? I mean, this is a private thing that should not have been asked. But they asked her. And she was shocked to hear such a question. And she was thinking how to answer. Immediately, she gets a hard slap from one of the girls and asked her, are you just stubborn? Are you arrogant? Why are you not answering me? This is all taking place in that room as she's still in that small room. And immediately another one comes, who is dead? Why are you bringing this coffin here? That is a suitcase of Casimiri. And she couldn't say anything. She's wondering, what is it? So immediately, of course, took everything out of her suitcase, they are naming each coffin and threw it out in the dustbin. And so this kind of bullying is actually verbal, physical, because she has been slapped. And action, her suitcase is taken outside. So this is what is taking place in the dormitory. The verbal and physical, and verbal, physical and dehumanization continues in Casimir's life. 
One of the girls asked her, what do you call yourself? He got hold of Casimiri's ears and led her to the room number four. In that room, of course, uh, other first years were already led there. They were already inside. They were dancing naked. And so Casimiri was shocked when she enters this room. And they tell her, take off your clothes. They ordered her. A group of angry girls fell on her and tore her clothes. They forced her to walk to the extreme end of the room and back amid this laughter of the spectacles, spectator, spectators. Some girls even pinched her buttocks as she commend, commended on her, on her figure, and some even poured water on her. So Casimire is now out of the room where she, she was and is taken to room number four, where the physical, uh, the continuous bullying is taking place. Other first years are all there, dancing naked, and the old girls are laughing at her. And of course, the physical bullying, we look at the way she, they, they took her clothes, and she's ordered to walk naked in the midst of laughter. And some courageous one, of course, ended up pinching her buttocks and pouring water on her. That's kind of physical action and verbal bullying that Casimiri is going through. The bullying continues. As um, she is now in the classroom, she has gone to the classroom, and there comes young men, two, and one of them, of course, pretended to be the headmaster because he was in a suit, and the other one was a deputy. So immediately entered the first class, class, first year's class. The first word is, stand up, you dung eaters. Can't you see that the honorable headmaster has honored you with a visit? So the deputy went direct to Casimiri and asked her, what is your name? Casimiri answers, Casimiri Jacinth. And the deputy says, from now onwards, you are the boss. You are the boss's wife in Senior One West. That is the, the bullying that takes place, the physical, verbal, and action bullying that takes place in the classroom. Maybe Casimiri would have been comfortable to be in a classroom where there is no bullying, but even in classroom, the same bullying is taking place. If not, it's becoming worse. So the next slide, Casimiri go, decides to go for lunch in the dining hall. And he finds all the boys and the girls are seated, but on her table, there was, she was the only girl. And so she sits. Immediately, this uh, young man called Ojuka started to disturb her. And she was already tired. She said, no, this cannot continue. So she refuses. And what happened, Ojuko? stands up, beats her with porridge, uh, with posture, and what comes? Of course, he gets, gets annoyed because the others were laughing at her. Ojuku was now behind her, took hold of the waist, and forced her to face him. Roughly started kissing her, and the students shouted, encouraging the obscenities. So we look at this as physical bullying, dehumanizing, and verbal. And the action, which I, I didn't put there, because uh, po throwing posho on her and squeezing him towards her, him and kissing her is uh, de dehumanizing her enough. So she goes to. After uh, kissing her, Ojuku gives Casimiri a hard slap, and Casimiri manages to balance herself with the tears, rage, shame, almost by blinding her vision. Bullying as portrayed by 
okurut shomo hendo kwanzi reports at school and she's actually the same as it was in uh, Goretti Shomohendo. She's ushered to the dormitory. And as she enters the dormitory, she hears that voice. There's a brigadier commanding all senior girls to go. They went to her bed, Akwazi's bed. And they commanded her to blow the bulb. And Kasimile was wondering how. I mean, I'm sorry. Nkwanzi was wondering how, how am I going to blow the bulb? And she was ordered, and I said, are you deaf or just stubborn or arrogant? She held Kwanzi to her feet, and now Kwanzi started to blow the bulb. And she, as she was blowing the bulb, she received a slap on her cheek. So she had to blow the bulb, she did that until her cheek pains her. Around midnight, we hear Brigade's voice commanding again, all tail, tails are first years. Out of the bed, it's time for you to come to the holy table and receive holy communion. Come quietly and quickly. There was a glass with a rust, rust colored liquid and bits of food of food of all sorts. Come, my children, eat his body and drink his blood. Then sing a song of praise. Brigadier is continuing to invite the first years, the tales to come to receive the Holy Communion. One by one, they went and received the Holy Communion. However, the wine tasted salty and Mickey, Kwanzi almost threw up. When the initiation ceremony was over, they learned to their bitterness that the wine had been urine and the bread food, food droppings. So this is physical, uh, it's verbal, dehumanizing, and action. Because we see Brigadier is, has become a priest. And so she prepares the girls' urinates in the, in the basin and put it in a cup, a rusted cup, and they go pick dropping, food droppings and put it in a saucer and come to serve the tails. And which was the wine, the urine, and the food, the, f the food dropping. Karoro continues to show us what takes place in the boarding school. This is the second uh, side, the side of the boys. Nkwanzi was in the side of the girls, and Karoro is showing us what happens in the boys' schools. Ntingo, as you can see from there, her, his first night, all the boys, the senior boys, paraded all the newcomers, and each senior boy picked a servant. We were then given the rules for the servants. A servant must make, I'm sorry, make his master's bed every morning, wash his plates, cups, and clothes, and many others. And that is verbal and physical. Of course, here, um, okay, I, I'd not seen that. So the second, they ordered the first years, must surrender all the grub they brought to the masters. The senior boys ordered the newcomers to accompany one of them, of course, to the farm. There, the boys are t told to have sex with one, of the bo with one of the pigs, and then they are forced they, okay, I've already said there. So at the end, the boys declare that they were all sick. They all became sick, and they wondered why they should come to school. 
The bullying did not only end with the teacher, with the, the students, it crossed over even to teachers, particularly Teacher Rose. Teacher Rose is this brown girl, very beautiful. The teachers and the students admired her. But one day, one of the students named her Bogoya. And so, I want to move faster. When the student named her Bogoya, the whole blackboard would be drawings of bananas. The students would start shouting in a whisper, Bogoya, Bogoya. Soon the students started putting Bogaya in the veranda of her house and her doorsteps and the compound. Whenever she gets out to go for a walk, some of her students on their way to the well would do, sigh her. And one student would shout at the top of her voice, Bo! Another one would hear from the other side of the hill and shouts, Go! And the third one would finish it by saying, yeah, the laughter would follow. So this teacher went through bullying that at the end of all that had happened to her, she decided to leave the school. She went to the headmaster, reported, and the headmaster, of course, told her, you just need to laugh it off. But of course, bullying, you cannot just laugh it off because there's a lot of a manifestation, we, we can see from what we have discussed, we have verbal bullying, physical, sensational, humanize, human, dehumanizing, experiential, and doing possible tasks. Bullying in schools has become part and parcel of educational value system in Uganda. The study concludes that the two novels portrayed Uganda schools as a place of bullying and torture. The bullying is very severe and traumatizing to boys, girls, and teachers. Because we see the teacher was leaving school. Okay, thank you very much, Naola. I think you put the first uh, slide so we know. Slide down. Back, back, back. <laughs> okay. It's now time for questions to learn this better. Uh, as you have heard, Mary has taken us through her two books, the books that she's studying, Doc, uh, that's Chomo Hendo's The First Daughter. Are they, do you have them here? Yeah, yeah and I can see that this is The First Daughter the first daughter, okay? And uh, the invisible women. So we are, we are looking at, in your case, bullying as the invisible evil, or bullying in the invisible evil, things that we usually don't see, but uh, they are really there, just like they there. And uh, in the first daughter, as you've 
very, very carefully shared with us. Uh, there are things that are happening with our great daughters, which they suffer in their lives, and we never get to know. While you are presenting, I was particularly touched, and I'm not going to ask my questions in any particular order, but I was particularly touched by the girls who were bullying each other, and they were actually using, they were putting themselves in the place of the most powerful in our society, the headmaster, the brigadier, and the priest. So they were not even doing whatever they were doing as themselves. They were impersonating. So are you trying to say, or are you able to read these habits of bullying in those particular offices of the headmaster, of the soldier, and of the priest in our ordinary life? Would we say we could find, or we actually find, these kinds of habits that are portrayed in the novel also in real life? Related to that, is the issue of servanthood and master, the servant-master relationship, followed by also the issue of homosexuality and bestiality. Could we also read from these novels that these deviant behaviors are also part and parcel of education system? that we are currently promoting or having in our schools. I will let my, colleague, my colleagues also to ask their questions, unless you want to answer question after question. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gulere. Uh, this is a real question. And when we look at Goret Shomohendo and Karoro Kuruti portraying what they are portrayed as the students personate or pretend to be the priest. Soldiers, head teachers, Shomo Hendo and, and uh, Karoro, they are portraying, depicting what is happening right now, or what has happened and what is still happening in the society. So she, uh, the, the two authors, portray or depict what they are depicting to make us learn or to know what is happening in the community, like schools, uh, the universities, the church, the companies. But it is happening in the real life. That actually someone can force a friend to have a sex with an animal, or can pretend to be a priest when he's actually not, he's a, pri not a priest. Or I can pretend to be a headmaster, but I'm not one. So what they are portraying is what is happening in the community right now. Of course, the issue of uh, homosexuality, bestiality, as portrayed by Great Shomohendo and Kororo, it's the real thing that is happening in the, in the world, in the real world where we are living right now. In the, and in the schools, um, either boarding school or day schools. We are already suffering from this homosexuality, which is a big issue in Uganda at the present time. Speak. Speak. Yeah. Speak. 
take care. Thank you. <coughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, for this presentation. I think it's not one of the one of the things you've uh, dealt with analytically in the in your thesis, is it? Yeah. Is it? Okay, I'll have to have a look at it more carefully. Um, it's under what, which theme? Which which big theme is it? Oh, okay, okay, good. So um, what I, th I think is the challenge here in your presentation, but that's a very interesting topic, first of all. So compliments for an interesting topic because we are all affected by that. We've gone through it in our own school days. We went through that. Uh, but I think the presentation here this morning could have um, benefited from a clearer approach, whereby I think I, what I would propose would be a kind of typology of bullying. I call it typology of bu bullying because I think there are different types of bullying and you can develop a typology of bullying but give it names. Um, under that typology, uh, maybe this, this, that, and the other. And I think you've tried to do that. You talked of physical bullying. You talked of verbal bullying. Um, and then the others are a little pr problematic. <laughs> but I think you also talked of experiential bullying. I would want to hear more about that, perhaps. And then you also mentioned doing impossible tasks. Uh, maybe you could have mentioned sexual bullying, uh, although it wasn't one of the points in your bullets which you presented towards the end. Um, but a t a developing a typology of bullying and naming those different types of bullying would be very beneficial, I think, for you. And then when presenting, you just go uh, type by type by type, and then give us examples of each type from both books. Yeah. Or, if you, books. Yeah, or if you want to do it separately, you can also still do it. Because I guess that uh, Okurut doesn't present just one type of bullying. I think she presents a number of them, and so does Goret Chomendo. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is always better when you are presenting like now, or even when you are writing so that things are very clear. Uh, there is only one thing I want to say to you, because you, pres you talked of dehumanizing bullying as if it is a separate thing from verbal bullying or physical bullying, but I say no, because all these types of bullying, all of them, you can say they, they dehumanize. So it's, it's not a separate thing, but, but it is in every type of bullying. So I think that's what I wanted to say. And then maybe finally, um, you have to pay attention. You know that I'm a, a particularist <laughs> for <laughs> spellings and things like that. And uh, I found a few things there which really you, you seem to, maybe you, are, you were in a hurry, but you just need to pay attention to them. I don't know what a tenant of a theory is. Probably are talking about a proponent of a theory, and so on and so forth. I won't say all of them, but uh, pay attention to those things. Uh, grab, which uh, children take to school. Pardon? Grab, grab, which children take to school. You know, ground nuts and and, uh, right. and, and peas and what have you. Is not it's not grab, G A R B, G R A B, but it's G R U B, and so on and so forth. A few of those other. Things which I have here, but I can give them to you separately, privately. And I think bullia. I, I I don't know whether you found that book in the that word in the book bullia. I, I think the, you know a person who bullies you is called a bully. He's not a bullia, <laughs> unless unless Goretti perhaps for some reason uh, use that word bullia. <laughs> but uh, person who bully. Oh, okay. Yes. It's possible. I mean, I'm not. Uh, 
but what, what I'm used to is that a person who bullies you is a bully. That, that person is a bully. Yeah. And the, the one who's bullied is, of course, the victim. He's a bullied one. OK. Uh, then you came in when we were, we had already covered the part of bullying in the US, but you can add your own voice to it. <laughs> this is, for example, from uh, two books uh, by Ugandan authors, uh, Chomuhendo Koreti, The First Daughter, and uh, Karuro Kuru, The Invisible Weapon. Uh, I don't know whether you are familiar with them, but Naula here is giving us a sharing of her work in progress, and this is one of the areas about education values. What are our education systems passing on to our children? Does the education, the school environment, provide for positive values, or it is one of those areas where we are getting these other challenges? Like this morning, we are in Mbale to determine a very important case. The justice of the High Court are looking at a certain kind of bullying. Does that kind of bullying originate from the school system, or does it uh, simply manifest as, uh, you know, we are naturally like that? Is there a nurturing that is deliberately uh, coming up through the, the, the school system? <coughs> Do we have traces of this in the families? that probably it comes from the families and so it is passed on since most of the children are in school for uh, most of their you know, youth life. Have the authors told us at what age these children, these girls, we would expect the girls to be behaving uh, in a much different way. But if they are the ones who are making their friends in their priestly manner drink urine and, and you know, scattered food, they are so authoritative and harsh. What is the message that we are getting? If you have any questions, any more questions? And Naula is here for the next three minutes to wrap up. in literature, so this is very exciting for me to be here with you. Maybe the question I would ask, which I, I don't have an answer, I would be curious as to what you believe, is the literature a response to what is happening, or is it the, um, is it translating what's happening in the schools, or is it encouraging? Is, it, is, is the book representing what's being seen, or is it pushing a particular value to transform what's happening? So what do you think? to what is in the community, in the schools right now. And of course in the communities, they are trying to, to tell, to expose what is in the community. That as a community, even if we decide to take our children in boarding school, we, we should be, we should be uh, aware that not everything in school is actually good. So she's exposing the evil that is in the schools. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's on, it's on, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm not asking a question, I just, uh, want to give my observation to, to observations. 
Mary Okurut, being uh, a student of literature and a lecturer, actually was a lecturer <laughs> in the literature at Makerere, must have had something beyond this word evil, which probably we haven't uh, mentioned. Because th th this is a huge, it's a huge symbol. And probably, I don't know, when you are writing, probably you might exploit it. Because I'm wondering whether one wouldn't bring in issues like uh, what is um, spoiling our children these days, the type of things they are reading, things they are getting from the internet, pornographic materials, etc., etc. Isn't that probably part of the invisible evil? Because it, it seems to have something <laughs> to do with the evil indeed. That is creeping, so, and our children are learning it. They are imitating that. And probably I don't know whether you will go further to uh, treat, what are the precautions of this on the students, apart from this emotional trauma and you know, uh, being, be feeling dehumanized, what kind of themes are going to come out of this tri traumatized mind. I'm thinking about things like, when you tease, I think you teach hatred. You teach revenge. Things that are going to manifest themselves later, so, so that there is a kind of, you know, continuity of the evil given by those who bled to those who were bled, and those who were bled are also going to propagate the same weevil. It's a kind of vicious circle. That, that's the way I see uh, 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 the meaning of that weevil inside there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe before you respond to that one, I would like you to go to a slide where you put values in brackets. probably earlier than that. Uh, there, there, no, no, there. No, no, in brackets. There was values, bullying in brackets. Uh -huh, that one. I think this is where the question that Dan has mm. pointed out. Uh, is literature, this literature representative of what is seen in the schools? And of course it is. And what values is it pushing for? Do we teach literature for literature's sake? Are we communicating these things because they are there? Or there is a value that we are passing on to the learners? When the learners read this book, is it on the syllabus? Somewhere, it was. So the number of people who have read and learned these things, what values have they learned? And what values do you see in this work of art as a post-colonial you know, literary critic? What would you say about this kind of work coming at a time when we are having all these challenges you've mentioned to the extent that the government can come up, the Minister of Education has come up with the sexuality framework so that they can start pushing these very agendas right from nursery school. What do we learn from these books? Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Then Mr. Peter Bismana and um, Dr. Guleri. Of course, Karoro Kuruti, I'll begin with Peter, portrays the evil that is, of course, the, the invisible evil is what we see in school, according to my research today. The evil that we, we are not able to see what is happening. When you look at Casimire, she's taken to school by the father, and the father goes home, 
And she is, he is thinking that all is well. Same to, uh, same to, to Kasimire and Nkwazi. You know, the parents are so excited that their children are going to school. They are going to learn and become better people. Like Chomo Hendo's, Kashimiri's mother was so excited that actually the child is not going to be like her. So she is working hard to make sure the child goes to school. But in the school, there are issues which is not known to the parents and to the community. And this invisible weevil, which the community is not aware, it's what the two authors are portraying. They're making us to see that actually not everything at school is good. There are some challenges that need to be handled. The values that are um, being portrayed in the school is the opposite. Because they're saying um, education should transmit knowledge, but it can be positive or negative. In this case, these are negative values that the students are getting. And so the values or the invis invisible weevil, the weevil that is seen there, at the end of the bullying, we hear Gora saying that, I'm going to do better. I'll bull the first years worse than what I've gone through. So that is the repercussion. It is going to continue unless the community or we are aware and be in a position to handle the evil that is in the school. So this kind of values brings bitterness. At the end of it, the students are bitter. There's a revenge, poor performance, um, and many others. Hatred, because if you made me to suffer, you've made me walk naked, I, there's no way such a student can be friendly. And when he comes back out from the school and is going to the community, of course we expect such a student to continue with the bullying, even in the office. And that's uh, where we concluded that the bullying does not only end at school. If the students is bullied at the school, the weaver will continue in the offices and even in the community. What to value? Uh, of course, the, what is the purpose of literature? Literature help us to know what is in the community. It's not um, just for us to read, but to understand what is in the community and how can we sort it out? How are we able to solve what is happening in the community? Right now we have the, um, the issue of homosexuality. It's a big debate. And to Shomohendo and Karoro Kuruti, it has been there. But maybe to the young generation, it's like it has just come. But it has been there because they would not have depicted in their novels. But the issue is how do we overcome these evils in the society, in the schools, in the offices, in the church? So, Chomo Hendo and Gretti, their work is to, to help us see and we are the ones to take an action and see how and where and when these things can be sorted out. So in those two books, you would say their message is to condemn bullying. Okay. Value, maybe. <laughs> Can you call that a value? Um, I don't know. See, value is sort of problematic as a word. <laughs> but you've said negative values, positive values, very helpful. But uh, so if, if the books are condemning, condemning bullying, what values are they recommending? one could ask oneself that question as well. I mean, maybe you could also enumerate three, four, five positive values, maybe kindness, maybe politeness, things like that, which really... The positive values that we expect the school to educate our children or our children to acquire uh, the values of sympathy, 
love, respect, yeah. hospitality, care. You look at, looking at these uh, students, they have never been at school. So uh, I would put it this way, that in African traditional way, these students are supposed to be received with love, with care, and they should be shown what to do. Because even, um, of course, I didn't see, uh, look at all the slides. Even when Casimira goes to the dining hall to eat food, she wanted to wash her hands, and she did not know how to use the forks. And so the friend just gets it and ask and throw it on her. And as she was eating, they're asking her, ha, huh, this one is real warrior. And they started banging the table with that, with the, with the, with the forks. So it is value that we should condemn so that we impart in our young ones the value of respect, of love, humility, care, and many others. It's in one of the slides there, Professor. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Let's give you a bigger clap now. <laughs> uh, we have another presentation. Yes, you're going? You're here. I'm loving it. Oh, good. Uh, thank you very much, Naula, for that wonderful insight. Just an eye opener. I drew the members' attention to a pullout in the, new, the newspaper in education yesterday where Gloria Nakajubi is writing on child abuse mm. and calling upon the children not to suffer in silence. They can call uh, 116, which is a toll-free number, in order to report any bullying, any child abuse. And here we have a number of children who have suffered bullying, who have suffered abuse, and they are giving their ideas. I, it is the duty of university and a research like yours uh, not only to expose, but also to show where the weaknesses are in our education system and in our general system uh, so that we can uh, have a better community. This paper you can look around. It will go to my archives. The, our next, our second presenter is... Uh, here with us, he's also going to build on the same subject, although he's dealing with a completely different, uh, you know, set of authors, but somehow there is a build on that subject in that he's looking at uh, the mirroring of the African Revolution in Ngugi Wathiongo's Petals of Blood, the crisis of consciousness in the same book and the delineation of women characters in Ngugi Wathiongo's fiction with particular reference to Petals of Blood. <coughs> He's doing an, an appraisal, the delineation of women characters in Ngugi Wathiongo's fiction. For us, the listeners would like to see whether there is a correlation but for him, Peter is doing uh, an appraisal of these three articles to, in particular, find a common goal, a common and possible uh, relationship between the three papers. He's going to introduce himself. He's uh, a first-year PhD student. Naula is a second year. Is it third? Oh, you're only in the third year. Congratulations. Peter is just beginning but he's a veteran teacher. You are welcome, Peter. I haven't uh, used the pen point like Mary because this to me, this to me, it's okay, I can be on any side. <laughs> this to me is going to be a good start 
of something I'm going to build on so that at least I can publish this article. So it is a kind of summary, but I'm going to flesh it up later and we'll see if I can be able to get it uh, published. So it is an appraisal of three articles on Ngugi's petals of blood vis-a-vis -vis women and the struggle for true independence. And the first article, Ngugi Wathiongu's petals of blood as a mirror of the African Revolution. This is Akimuni Ultola, I think Nigerian, I think. Then the crisis of consciousness in the petals of blood by Dr. Palavi Baldavaj, I think this is Indian. The third delineation, delineation of women characters in Ngugi Wathiongo's fiction, Dr. Sakshi Semar. This is a, an Indian lady, I think. The abstract, appraisal of these articles is approached through Ngugi's trademark historiography how colonial and post-colonial pressures and challenges merged to shape, change, and dehumanize Kenya society, Kenyan society. It is the depiction of continued master-slave relationship through a history of suffering, first at the hands of foreign invaders, and then, ironically, of post-independence black enslavers. And I have a few A few articles I got this from. This article, therefore, should examine how well the three articles assess Ngugi's literary history in Petrol's of Blood as the result of negative foreign and local forces in the politics of Kenya. The article should also appraise how this literary history turns into an alaluta continua war cry in which women are seen to play a crucial role as liberators. The appraisal will first summarize the key issues raised by the three articles before delving into a critical assessment of how they are just properly captures this role of revolutionary women in petrols of blood. And there are key words that would be explained as I go on. Consciousness, mirror, social change, historicity. Sorry, sorry. Then we have... Oh, have I gone too fast? Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. Come on. So this article, the first article, which is... Is Petrol's of Blood a Mirror of the African Revolution? That's the one. It takes us through the plot and the style connection by connecting the symbol of the drought to the journey symbol from drought stricken old Irimorog, which is another symbol, to the splendor of Nairobi and the square of its slums and then back to Anili Morogu that soon turns from a symbol of sterility to an industrial and capitalist complex, a city where apartheid, he says, apartheid is practiced. So when he's talking through his essay, this symbol of the drought, the one of the journey, the one of Iri Morogu, they are all combined and is trying to explain thematically what it's all about. What are they going on the journey to see? Because the journey is a politicization process. Akimwani briefly takes us through the horrors of corruption and exploitative capitalist transformations spearheaded by Mzigo, Chui, and Kimeria. And juxtaposed to these capitalists, is Wanja, one of the major female characters, 
whom Akimani says represents Kenya, Kenya's deprived young womanhood, but is now undergoing intellectual, psychological, political, and indeed womanhood changes. Because after the journey, lots of things are changing, and some of the peasants, peasants have also found a, a way to live, to earn life. But very soon, of course, that is going to change. Akimwan even approves her whole house as a necessary tool for acceptable violent revenge against neocolonial thieves. It should be thieves, so and the oppressors. I'll be coming back to this very, very important area because I have some exception. Name sounds similar to Akimuni. Akimuni, the Akimuni. Akimuni. Yes. Okay. All right. Akimuni, not Akimwani. Okay, Akimumi. So the author of this article is Akimuni. All right. Thank you. Thank you. In this bit, you are talking of Akimwani. I got confused. Yeah, it's like the way we must pronounce our own names because <laughs> it's Nigerian. <laughs> right. That's right. The second one, I hope I'll get that other name correct. The second article, the crisis of consciousness in the petrols of blood. And with this consciousness, what he's talking about is are people aware of what they should do to get their situation better? That at least is the just of the, uh, of the article. So, in this second article, uh, he devotes quite some space detailing and condemning those ills of neocolonialism propagated by the black bourgeoisie. As in Gugi, he advocates collective action to empower ordinary masses to resist oppression. And he takes a strong exception to a writer a certain Don, Don Paul, who's the article, tuning to, sorry, turning toward the world. Ngugi's petals of blood, and his sight is also <coughs> there. And he thinks Ngugi's order is a button to his potential to prevail over the political will which affects the global progress, progressive movement. However, sorry. However, as in Petros of Blood, Ngugi still hasn't identified himself with a political cause for overturning the whole thing. Palavi takes quite some space to answer Don with elaboration on the following. So Ngugi, yeah, it's okay. Ngugi's life as a devotion to detailing the range in cultural change it delineates, uh, delineates in the petals of blood. He takes quite some bit of time trying to show that Ngugi is very devoted indeed, so it's not that he doesn't really uh, get involved in showing how he's going to overturn the whole thing. And then the adoption of two techniques in Ngugi this multiple protagonists with a timeline shifts from past to present reminiscences and taking us through very nice experiences representing the masses past and present sufferings. In other words, when you go to Monira, Karega, um, Wanja, Abdallah and others, and you look at their past, what they tell us, what they have lived, they are giving us the history of suffering. Each one does that. So he is showing, therefore, that Ngugi is doing that using his protagonists. And he goes into history, then he uses his characters, and he's saying, those of us readers, decipher what I want, get out what I want. Then, of course, the condemnation of true Muzigo Kimeri and Brother Ezekiel 
this religious person, they become symbols of that black bourgeoisie class of opportunists and capitalist exploiters dominating this dark history of Kenya. So you can see this contrast. They tell us their dark lives. These ones are there to show us how capitalism is working. And I think indeed Ngugi, I, I mean Don, uh, is a bit unfair. In other words, that's what he's saying. He's unfair to him. Then, uh, character sketch of each protagonist is also given. The history and why each is running away to hide in this Irimorog. And you know, Irimorog is not, the old Irimorog is not the best place for people to go to. It's a dry place where people, young people are running away. Only old people stay here. So why are they coming in this dry place? Because we are on a journey. That's what he starts with. We are on a journey to find out why are people running away from here? What has caused it and so on? Then uh, the politicization journey then is the one which details the clash of Irmorg peasants with each of these capitalists when they go to Nairobi. So we imagine that they are there to find out how Kimeria lives, how Chui lives, how Muzigo lives, how these reverends live, and they just see splendor of Nairobi, total <coughs> contrast. And they, when they reach the Andiri Wariera, their MP who has deserted them, he turns against them and wants even to get them imprisoned. So when you find, therefore, that people are running away from the old Irmorog, they are getting attracted to some place where they can earn a living. Now Ngugi says, let me turn this Irmorog, the dry place, into a beautiful city and see what happens then. They take over, these capitalists, they take over Irimorog immediately, and they begin to industrialize it. And the Fengeta, we'll talk about that later, the Fengeta complex, the thing which to a lady in Yakinua, the old woman, is something to bring up the spirit of the old cultural values. But eventually Ngugi turns it into something that makes money. They take it over as well. And we find the Thengeta industries brewing and so on, making plenty of money. So we have now a total social, political, economic, and cultural routing of affairs in Kenya. That's what Palavi says. He then shows us Wanja juxtaposed with these people because she's going to be very crucial. Wanja in a head start making money with Abdallah and her brothel, but is soon plunged into reliance on only sex trade because she sells all she has to redeem her grandmother's stolen land. And the part of illustrates how these tribulations No, 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 just talk. It's, in, it's okay. It's All right. Okay. So, <coughs> um, yes. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Palavi says how these tribulations reshape Wanja now. And quote, he says, she's not the one to submissively take life's path and survive by constantly metamorphosing, in, uh, metamorphosing into new roles. He adds, the economic deprivation and ruthless dispossession of the peasants find its most effective symbol in the degradation of Wanja. We'll see more about the degradation of this lady, this woman, because she's going to be the key they want to control the three, uh, the three articles. Do these three articles show her to be a real, real liberator or not? 
we'll come back to that. That's why she's central and put juxtaposed with these ones. Now, Have I jumped it? No, no, go to the third article now. Oh. Mm. Never mind, never mind. Okay. Yeah. The delineation of women characters in Ngugu Wathiyongu's fiction. The article is very short, five pages, and it sets out to show, according to its abstract, subjugation of women by society, men, customs, and tradition, and how women are portrayed as victims of colonialism, patriarchy, oppressed figures, mothers, and also freedom fighters, and also how they are repeated against the unjust social, economic, and political order, yet they are required to play positive roles for the establishment of a new order. And it is not developed, we only get how she glosses over Ngugi's activism championing a rejection of Christianity as part of colonialism, campaigning for the welfare of African women and the other marginalized groups in the African society. But she appreciates Ngugi's elevation of his women in the later novels. We are talking of Matigari and, uh, and uh, the others where women are raised to a higher status, almost like in a, a grain of wheat. Sakshi gives a brief proof of women's subjugation by using, for instance, whip not child. And he's talking about Ngotho as a polygamous man mistreating his wife. Pardon? Mistreating <laughs> his wives and so on. Then women are turned prisoners and sex objects during Mau Mau. But she juxtaposes this with the praise for women who struggled for their freedom and supported Mao Mao against uh, uh, colonial power. And Wanja is Ngugi's depiction of the most exploitative section of the African women in African society under neocolonial and imperialistic conditions and is a victim of sex exploitation. And he ends saying, Wanja family believes in the philosophy that you eat somebody or you are eaten. And, and Wanja thinks there is no difference between a worker and a prostitute. We'll get to this very soon. Now, the synthesis of each cut, uh, the, 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 they are detailed because we want to find out how they go to the gist of this struggle of women in Kenya. Now, for instance, one thing that they do not look at is what is causing this struggle to go on. It's the land question. And I have put its significance both as something that sustains the life and is the cause of all the suffering right from the beginning. This is why the Aryan novels are all dealing with the land question. You took away our land, you made us homeless, and this is why now we are unemployed and even uh, any capitalist is doing what they want with us. In the Whip Not Child, it is very nice report because that's why it all starts. In the river between, something worse takes place because this land is connected to the spirit thing, of the ancestors, to the God who gave it to us. Now you've taken it away, and this whole thing is what I have called almost iconoclastic. Because when circumcision takes place in this book, we hear the singing and dancing and everything. The blood that goes in this soil is an affirmation, we belong to you, ancestors. But all of that has been taken away by the Colonialism. Now, in a grain of wheat, colonialism is going, and we are fighting this Mao Mao war. And therefore, what we end with in this novel is where Petro's old blood takes over. We are saying in a grain of wheat, we sold our blood by fighting Mao Mao. We expected to have harvested, but now who is eating all the wheat? And Petro's old blood is saying, we want this wheat. So, this is where now, can we say that 
are they doing it, these three articles, are they answering that question? Another thing that doesn't seem to come out of these articles is Wanja's ambivalent characterization. None of them is touching it. Wanja is a complex character whose traits are threaded out rather vaguely because of perhaps a mix-up in the plotting of this novel. First of all, the clash with the polygamy and patriarchy, Ngugi makes her become a victim of this. That's one thing. And you can see when she goes through all the prostitution, ends up getting, uh, sorry, first getting uh, pregnant, leaves the school, the father chases her out of the home and so on. And then she takes up the most mean form of employment, prostitution, and when this child becomes a burden, she throws it out, <laughs> throws it away in the latrine. So she's had a very horrible life, we can see that. Can she now respond and say, let me join the forces with those fighting the government? I think something else occurs in this book. Wanja doesn't do that. Instead, we are presented with her life as something that is followed by the fire. Just as Palmer says, we have this fire, four times actually in the book. And when he says that it is a fire to purify her, uh, some of us put a question mark about that. Because uh, he tries to show us that this fire can be justified as indeed something that's going to tell the, 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 what, the capitalists that uh, uh, we are going to burn you up and so on. And that's why he quotes Eagleton, who says that sometimes you don't have to physically show it, but it can be implied. And my, my query is that this political experience must may be convincing in the overall objective of the novel to punish everyone by even mere suggestion of arson. But the concern here is that this is acceptable after reading it artistry, a convincing plotting and dramatization. First of all, within the novel plot, not even Wanja knows the actions. Her plot to kill the capitalists has no hint whatsoever about the fire. In fact, her idea is to butcher each capitalist, each as they come for sex. Moreover, the murderous plot springs from anger after Karega has rejected sex with her. Interestingly, in answering Inspector Godfrey about the murder at the fire who she suspects, she distracted the number of zone about nobody. It is her family that has always lived under fire and myself like that. That becomes the topic. So, Monira, who buys her residence, Monira's arson action, therefore, is surely satellite to suit all his enemy actions because, after all, Ngugi says he's an outsider. He is incapable of participating in the struggle. So, uh, it diverts the plot to focus on an accidental detail instead of directing the reader to how one and Karega are completely a theme of liberation. In fact, when he ends the book in that last part, we forget about the liberation struggle. Just pick us out, just like that. Then the sex and the revolutionary tools. This sounds Hammurabi war, not Hammurabi law, on a purely personal and military basis, a personal, a personal scheme to avenge herself on society through individual profit. To make it even more intriguing is why a major participant in the revolutionary struggle should hunt for the most beautiful young girls to grace her brothel and propagate moral degeneration. Questions also arise when we think of how she ignores Caritas and Duguna's shocked reaction as she accepts to be raped by Kimiria while in Nairobi. Now, Karega is a revolutionary leader. 
there is the data of the revolutionary conceptualization. Why does his reaction and the winner differ from Hayek if sex is an acceptable tool of revenge in a revolutionary struggle? Palmer tells us that the book wants to show us through wages and exploitation the theme of social disintegration, thorough uh, demonstration of the causes of prostitution in modern African societies. So my point of view is also that even when she has understood this evil, why she must continue this co uh, corrupting practice as part of the means of the revolutionary struggle? In this journal, Tsongera tells us, Tsongera tells us, Plus. the colonial, the, sorry, the collapse of the evil community from Granda to the situation is the byproduct of two historical processes. The legacy of the Holy Spirit of colonialism in Christianity. So that bring commerce, civilization, the Bible, oil, God, and then the Holy, uh, Holy Spirit of neocolonialism, that, the, that Holy Spirit brings the corruption, brings this money, prostitution, and so on. Now, so, uh, again, it makes another very important remark about responsible characterization. The nature, sorry, a notary ought to know the nature of society and grasp in society as a, a total reality, a totality, sorry. But you must not present society and its laws in an abstract way and characters and situations that bind together general and particular laws in the sense that through the character and the events in which the character is involved, the author presents the universal laws that govern society. Now, prostitution and brutal teaching cannot qualify Wanda to be a prison, a prison fighter for those universal laws that govern society. She, she has no sense of that. Another area of concern is Wanda's pregnancy. It is intriguing, too, that it should be the crippled of Ghana to end Wanda's symbolic. It is an interesting of how she keeps the string of men from knowing they all share her. Even on that Sunday night of Alpha, it is courageous, expected, and he comes, but his reaction is startling, and he is our leader of revolution. Karega felt the illusion of returning to sleep with her. Nevertheless, Looking at her, he could not help marveling at how Wanda could be different people in different times and places and situations. The secret of her continuing success, I think, that is what she that she could appeal to so many different people at men at different times, as if each could find reflected in her the position of his being. He could not help sighing at Western talent. Now, if Mbugi is cutting <coughs> the texture of his character, how then is this one going to convince us that she's a freedom fighter? Then he refines love making, he refuses, causing her this agony. Oh, it's not true that I've, I've been alone. I've been with the men. But it's not me true. I have loved life. Life, life. This is individuals. And I want a child. I want a this girl. If this girl is pleased, hates behaving like a Maria and is careless about the whole situation. Soon after, as if she knows for sure she's paying for her sin of the fat side, she suddenly sets about planning to murder the capitalist with the help of Abdullah. And the foregoing confirms that one has no discerning mind for progeny choice within the plot. The complexity of Wanya's character has been plunged into a sex plot that is bound to provoke social, moral, and even aesthetic controversy. Karega of Washington in Wanya 
and in Yakiniwa. Do we have the two also uh, national demands that we are to reach the last point? Kareka stands out as the chief protagonist in the American leader. He leads women forward. Even the Nakinua was dominated in the of affairs, peters out as soon as Karega gets on the scene. In the history, in that exploration, Lenin, who was the only state of blood, this scholar outlined the position necessary for women to contribute successfully towards a proletariat struggle for control of the economy. Scale down this male chauvinism. With regard to this theme of women in the struggle, Ngugi's literary historiography blends more convincingly in the earlier novels. In comparison, one years or one year to new and also hello, hello, as a freedom fighter, figure just failed when he pitted against Karega's diamonds. He wants to take over everything. As for infinity, there is ample evidence to show that characters and space of operation in the of blood are localized and dominated by a thin uh, uh, decree nationalism. The name, the predatory tools that those narrated, performed by Murphy, the band of capitalists, the setting, everything revolves around a single uh, tribe. Whether we talk about men or women getting to reshape Kenya in a social uh, scheme, the wider picture of intercultural and interinstitutional nationalism must be the key. Otherwise, one tribe cannot move the whole <coughs> nation to revolve. In other words, the theme of the struggle is a failing in this book. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for that sit here. Uh, we have about, uh, well, a few minutes, less than 10 minutes, because today there is a community worship, so we need to end early and walk to that event. Uh, we will take some two, three questions or remarks, which Peter can write down. Um, one thing I recognize here is that in his presentation, I could connect with the first presentation about the master-slave relationship that these girls and boys promote, the history of suffering, how those, uh, you know, the fact that you are going through certain things in the, you've gone through certain experiences and how those experiences follow you uh, in later life, post-independence, black enslavers again, the revolutionary women in the petals of blood, similar to the revolutionary women in that school who are sending people uh, to, to, to a particular room, uh, like, just like a Nero Morog of sorts. And the girls and the boys are there in the war house, eh? in the war house eh, where these things are happening. Is it a necessary tool for the acceptable violence or revenge against the neoclassists? Uh, so this paper here, actually goes further to elaborate on uh, some of the things that are happening around us. And the question is, where do they come from? How do they manifest? He has ably told us that it is the very people, the very Africans who are doing these things. It's not the foreigners. Where did they learn this? Where are we having all these um, uh, tortures and this? Uh, very, very absurd behaviors in these societies. It's time for us to raise our questions or concerns. Okay, thank mm. you. Mm -hmm. I, well, my challenge with this is that uh, uh, I think Mr. Aringo seems to be a specialist, and I think he is on Ngugi and on uh, Petros of Blood. And for this particular presentation, I, for one, wasn't really well prepared uh, to be able to. Because I mean, you are talking about you are talking about the three articles which have been written by people who are specialists on Ngugi, on Petros of Blood. You yourself are a specialist, and here we are a little bit 
um, taken by surprise, really, but it's very good. I, I want to congratulate you on um, giving me the, uh, I think, um, the, 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 the correct, I believe it's correct impression that you, you, and you, you know Petros of Blood very well and also Ngugi very well. So thank you for that. But I would have obviously, I think when presenting in a, a group like this, it may be a good thing always to give a summary of Petros of Blood, just like that. So that, because there may be people who have never even read Petros of Blood. Uh, I don't blame you for not doing it, but uh, I think perhaps it's just a lack of preparation on our part if we had been uh, uh, duly uh, advised, we would probably have um, uh, read at least a summary of Petrus of Blood and then have been able to, com uh, you know, comment intelligently. But let me just <coughs> ask you one question arising from this, the, your very last sentence on page eight at the very bottom. Uh, I think this is your observation, the very last sentence. Uh, I just want to know something there. You are saying that whether we talk about men or women getting to reshape Kenya in a social scheme, the wider picture of intercultural and inter-ethnic nationalism must be key. This is your observation, but I want to know, is it also the observation of Wangugi? I assume it is, but I, I want to hear you on it. And uh, how about the three authors that you, you talk about? Are they, uh, are they not seeing this or what? It's just my, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that. Any other questions? how one uses literature to bring that out. And what, if you could talk about the use of literature to talk about oppression and, and that cycle. Uh, you mean the cycle of... Uh, the cycle of uh, neocolonial mistreatments or particularly... I think that cycle of the oppressed becoming yeah. the oppressors and that constant Thank you very much, uh, the three of you, because your question is actually <coughs> going to be almost like uh, uh, the one of uh, Dr. Guleri. There is a cycle, certainly, let me start with that. Uh, and this is the thing that worries very many people, that after fighting a Mau Mau war, and we have said we've won, now let's go and share the spoils of war, and we regain our land. Unfortunately, the thing that brings it all to naught is bad politics. And if we can go in a bit of a history, just, just briefly, Kenyatta himself is blamed by historians as one of the causes. He was supposed to have uh, undertaken this redistribution of land. So what happened? All the white lands now go to the people who are in the government. So it was a matter of removing a white man in a mansion, bringing a black man, give him all the things that the white man had. And nobody thinks that this greed is going to nurture horrific things. And so you find that the majority of these are from the Gikuyu tribe. And that's why everybody keeps hinting, every scholar keeps hinting on no matter what uh, Ngugi does, how many millions of books he writes, decolonization, and so on and so forth, unless he sees that his own tribe was first and foremost the cause of all of this turmoil, 
then things are not, he's not going really to win the laureate, <laughs> which he has been waiting for. It's one thing he has failed to see. And people have been praising Petros very good, very good. But the book is a failure, artistically and thematically. It has failed to hit the point. So the causes of the cycle, greed, eh? not wanting to individualism, tribalism. Who were giving jobs to fellow tribalists? Gekuyu people. Who were giving scholarships? Gekuyu people. Who were getting loans? Gekuyu people. So you can see that the weavers were nurtured from one tribe. And once they have got into the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the things, nobody's going to take them out. The jam is planted once and for all. That's why even these three articles, I don't know whether they just praise Ngugi for the sake of praising. None of them is touching these issues that are making the book fail to realize it's a theme. You can't bring a wanja, a halot, and you say that's my pillar of the revolutionary struggle. You just can't. In fact, for lack of space, there were some, uh, um, some authors I had wanted to quote, really at length, about the failure of Ngugi to really bring out this theme of the struggle by bringing in other ethnic groups. Why should you have a whole huge book of almost 400 full of honorary Gikuyu people? Aren't there other tribes in this nation? <laughs> you failed to really see what he was after. Too big. Actually, I'm, I am happy that uh, our questions have made you say that. Beco because actually, uh, <laughs> For me, that's uh, an interesting learning point about Ngugi. Uh, I wasn't getting it from your presentation, but our, uh, your answer to these questions has, have, has made you say it. And it's very interesting to me because I thought, in fact, that Ngugi had that uh, the, uh, side of Kenya in mind as well in presenting um, the Kikuyu one could probably argue that he was uh, saying, yes, the, the, the tribes are there. Obviously, they shouldn't, they shouldn't, one tribe shouldn't dominate the rest of the tribes in a, an, an African multi-tribal, multicultural nation. That shouldn't happen. But is, is, really, is Ngugi really saying that? Is he just obsessed with Kikuyu and, and, um, and, and is he totally neg negligent of the need for other tribes also to be taken care of in good governance? Uh, this is a question to you because you have really <laughs> made a case of Ngugi being kind of absorbed uh, in, in, in things Kikuyu. Uh, and I just want you to hear, I, mean, I, want, I, I really haven't read much, much Ngugi uh, except some of his es essays and, uh, and uh, The River Between. So I think it's an interesting point you've made there, but I want really to be confident that if I uh, quote you, uh, I, I, won't be, I won't be stoned or something like no. that no. by <laughs> fanatics I, 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 I actually have, I, I have some evidence that when he gets, t t when he, he, he goes and he follows one line, he never seems to look aside. And uh, I was thinking probably one of these days I'm going to test myself by writing an article on this business of his, we must reject foreign languages and the use of our naturals and so on. I'm thinking of writing a big article to show that this is a fanaticism. Okay. Uh, uh, th 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 thank you very much because that's what is on the board now. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, sit down. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is also another article that appeared in Mualimu, teaching in longer languages is improving performance. And as you've just heard, uh, Peter is saying that is fanaticism. <laughs> <laughs> so in our next discussion, we shall be presenting our report from the Department of Languages and Literatures 
on the Uganda Christian University creative writing, reading, translating, and publishing for children in local languages. That will be our next symposium, but we shall also invite uh, students from the masters and, uh, well, already Peter has expressed his next article. is going to be on how our focus on <laughs> local languages is fanaticism from the Ngugi point of view, and I'm very sure that um, Naula and the others uh, Mulumbi Paul might be able to give us a paper in our next discussion. So this is here for us, but we, we are not going to, to, to discuss it now. I wanted to thank you very much for uh, coming to this symposium. Uh, I'm very sure that we have learned so much from it, and we are able to inform society about what we are doing here. The fact that we have many of our children in schools most of the time, and for us, the adults are always at work. We never have chance to speak and listen to the children the way these writers have spoken and listened to them. I would have personally desired that this kind of work, uh, like Aristotle says, is not given out to the children because it also scandalizes them. It makes them see things that they shouldn't be seeing. And probably many of them would want to go and do the same things. But there it is. It has been there for many years. And so we are probably not even right to say that these are Western things, things coming from the West. It has been with us as human beings. How do we address them? We are seeing it in the, in the petals of blood, in the, in the works that Peter has presented. How do we uh, get back the image of the mother, of the girl, of all those values that Naula was talking about? We have always the newspapers publishing these things, and it, we are not reactionaries, but we are providers of knowledge. Let us share this knowledge that we have found with forums such as this so that uh, we can keep the discussions going from a knowledge point of view. I thank you very much, uh, Professor Manuel Muranga. Thank you very much, Professor Dan Ross, for making it all the way from West Nile, <laughs> where you've been. And uh, of course, a few weeks before, right from the US. Thank you very much, Paul Mulumbi from, uh, is it uh, Kampala University? And uh, yes, and Kamuli in Busoga. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Aringo Peter from Kabale. Uh, Kabali University, right. uh, Kabali University, and uh, our own Naula from Uganda Christian University. Um, Reverend Deacon, Dr. Gulede, coordinator of the programs of graduate studies. I wish you a happy week, and thank you for making it here. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, for giving us and hosting us. Thank you. Closing prayer. Dr. Gulere told me I don't have a caller, so I'm not entitled to pray. <laughs> but I'm grateful for this opportunity. <laughs> it's an, op an, op an eye opener. I might uh, enroll for MLIT. Huh? No? MDiv. Yes, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to say thank you for this opportunity to come and learn. What the Bible says, my children perish for lack of knowledge. We thank you for our supervisors, Dr. Glere, uh, Professor Moranga. We are grateful that they can offer their time and be with us in such a time. We are grateful for the guidance, for the help, and we pray uh, that you continue to lead us and guide us. Father, see us through this course, and we give glory and honor to you. Thank you for um, our host, the people have given us the hall to present from and for the Uganda Christian University. We are grateful and thankful. Be with us even as we leave this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Mark, for this streaming, and Dorothy for the wonderful and great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>